Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Gilded Age Symposium. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. We're grateful so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to join us as we continue exploring this important uh, chapter of American history and its different impacts on different uh, sections of America, on different groups of American people. Uh, I will mention uh, from the start here, we are in November, uh, and it is uh, Native American, American Indian Heritage Month, uh, and Washington, D.C. is uh, the uh, ancestral home of the Nakachank uh, or Anacostia people. Uh, I know we're going to hear from our, our wonderful scholars uh, about their different areas of the country uh, and their indigenous peoples. But before we get to all of that, I'd like to talk through a little bit of the technical housekeeping of how we use this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our wonderful audience, uh, while we're still limited in how we can interact in person. Uh, if you have any content-based questions for our incredible scholars today, you can put those content questions in the Q&A section of the webinar that looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using to join us today. If you have any technical troubleshooting matters, if you feel like you're having difficulty hearing us or seeing us, you can put those queries into the chat section of the webinar. I will be keeping an eye on the chat section and answering in real time. Uh, but again, any content-based questions for today's speakers can go into the Q&A section and Jane will pose those questions at the end of the webinar. And now it's also my great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to start today's program. Jane. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, as always, for putting these fine webinars together. We have certainly been taking a walk through the Gilded Age and looking at some of the important lessons that we might learn from looking at our history. So today, uh, we are looking at the economic impact uh, of the changes of the Gilded Age with a particular eye toward disparate impact on Native American populations, disparate impact on African Americans uh, within our country. And we are so fortunate today to have two distinguished scholars who are gonna share with us their perspectives from their own uh, research as scholars. Our first speaker, Dr. Alexandra Harmon, is a, got a fascinating history She's a Yale Law graduate who advised and represented Indian tribes in Washington State for 15 years and then decided to earn a history PhD at the University of Washington, where she is now a professor emerita of American Indian Studies. She is the author of three books, Rich Indians, Native People and the Problem of Wealth in American History, published in 2010, a Journal of American History article, Indians and Native and Land Monopolies in the Gilded Age, and an essay entitled Dispossessed Wards, From Dispossessed Wards to Citizen Activists, American Indians Survive the Assimilation Policy Era. So we really look forward to Dr. Harmon's perspective on the impact of the Gilded Age on Native Americans. She will then turn the podium over to Dr. Jeanette Eileen Jones. And Dr. Jeanette Eileen Jones is an Associate Professor of History and Ethnic Studies at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, who is currently working in Buffalo. Uh, she's a historian of the United States with expertise in American culture and intellectual history and African American studies. Her research expertise and interests include the Gilded Age and Progressive Era history, transnational history, pre colonial Africa, the history of science, and digital history. She is the author of In Search of Brightest Africa Reimagining the Dark Continent in American Culture, 1884 to 1936 and is currently working on her second monograph, America in Africa, U.S. Empire, Race, and the African Question, 1821 to 1919, which is under advanced contract with Yale University Press 
and her collaborative digital project to enter Africa from America, the United States, Africa, and the new imperialism, 1862 to 1919. So you can see that each of these scholars has a deep understanding of this particular period of time, the Gilded Age uh, in our history, a time when we saw industrialization, we saw incredible uh, income inequality emerge, we saw a whole raft of activities that laid a foundation for our country even today. So let us start with our scholar of Native American history, Dr. Harmon. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jane. I'm really, I'm very pleased to be here. I really appreciate this opportunity. I especially appreciate the fact that the Historical Society recognizes that American Indians, Native American peoples are an essential part of the Gilded Age story. In fact, they are, were a major preoccupation uh, of Americans in the national capital during the Gilded Age. So my, my assignment, if you will, from the society uh, to talk about the economic status of indigenous peoples, American Indians in this period. And that is a lot. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot possible, a lot of things I could talk about uh, in large part because one of the first points I hope you will take away today uh, and that is the great diversity of the people known uh, now and then as American Indians. So I wanna start here. Let me start first by sharing my screen. I wanna start where I am here in Seattle, Washington. I am on the ancestral lands and the ancestral territories, including the waters of indigenous peoples. Um, we now call by the general name Coast Salish, more specifically the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot tribes of today, their ancestors. In the Gilded Age at the end here of the 1880s, 1890s, um, the people, native peoples of the Puget Sound region around what's now Seattle had been in contact with, or action with uh, non-native peoples, colonial explorers and then colonial settlers for five decades. Uh, and in that period had become quite involved in uh, interactions, economic, commercial, and other kinds of interactions with uh, these newcomers. Um, and um, in many cases, most cases, I would say were, uh, if not prospering, doing or considering themselves to be doing fairly well uh, by a combination of labor, usually seasonal labor, some domestic labor for the newcomers combined with uh, their historic, traditional, long, long, long running practices of supporting themselves by taking advantage of the rich natural resources of our area, uh, by fishing, by uh, uh, hunting in some cases, gathering, and by trading. So uh, you might have, if you lived here then, you might have seen um, these people, in a, these are native peoples in a village that they had constructed uh, across the water from the city or town of Seattle by about 11 miles. Um, 
And uh, you can see the fish that they're drying there. Dr. Harmon, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we don't have your screen share yet. So if oh, we can. I'm sorry. I am sorry. sorry about that. All right. What have I done wrong here? So if you can navigate back to the uh, Zoom uh, window, you can um, uh, use the, uh, we can get to the screen share. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Got so busy talking. It's quite all right. Have Dr. Jones talk and I'll figure this out. Okay, certainly. Um, well, we can, okay, so we can come back to you. Uh, Dr. Jones, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, let me uh, bring you up and we can go ahead and um, we'll see if we can resolve Dr. Uh, Harmon's uh, uh, IT. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, if you're ready, we would love to hear from you. Perfect. We see your, there we go. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, and if, oh, and let's uh, make sure we get you unmuted uh, so we can uh, hear you as you, as you share, uh, share your wonderful history with us. All right. Well, good afternoon. And I want to thank um, the U.S. Uh, I, I'll say the full name, the United States Capitol Historical Society for inviting me um, to present um, this afternoon on African-Americans and the Gilded Age economy, 1865 to 1900. And I'm so pleased to be joining Professor Harmon um, today to talk to you about um, the disparate impact, disparate impact of uh, Gilded Age economies on African-Americans and in her talk on indigenous Native American peoples. So as was said, I am at the University of Nebraska, but I'm here today um, coming from the university uh, at Buffalo. And so I would like to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which the university at Buffalo operates, which is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee, um, Six Nations Confederacy. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It is also covered by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. Today, this region is still the home of the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. Thank you. So today I wanna to talk briefly about um, the economics of the Gilded Age before I kind of jump specifically into um, African-American experiences. Let me say that um, as we know that the Gilded Age was a time of rapid economic and industrial growth. And in fact, during that time, the American economy nearly doubled in size. And if you're interested in, to, in reading more about that, you can go to www.ushistory.org has a wonderful synopsis of how that economy doubled in size. We also know that during the Gilded Age, there were two important panics. The first, or what we call similarly, sort of recessions. Um, they're not as big as the Great Depression, but they had um, significant impact on the United States economy. Um, and both saw the, both panics saw the birth or emergence of new political parties who were trying to address um, economic inequality in the United States. So when the panic of 1873 took place, this is in the middle of reconstruction, which is also part of the Gilded Age, um, some, some scholars say it begins in 1877, but other scholars do include um, immediately after the Civil War, and I tend to be one of those. I start with 1865. The Greenback Party became an important part of the political landscape of the United States, responding um, to that panic and thinking about uh, gold and silver. Um, we also saw the panic of 1893, but before that panic even happened, we started to see various people um, coming together to uh, not only address the politics of the day, so for instance, things like um, the lack of direct election of the Senate, um, voting rights, et cetera, but thinking about um, the impact of the economy specifically on agrarian um, parts of the United States, rural parts of the United States. And this is where you get the populist movement um, of the 1880s with the famous Omaha platform being issued in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892, 
where they officially called themselves the people that gather there, uh, the People's Party, and sometimes you would see um, the Populist Party. What's interesting during this time is that there were some black and white coalitions around some of the key economic issues of the day, um, whether it's about creating sub-treasuries, um, how um, wealth taxation, that there should be some kind of graduated income tax, things of that nature. And so as that movement was getting um, um, some steam and was really getting momentum um, within a decade, um, you have this panic, like I said, in 1893, which basically lasts for four years. It ends in 1897. And so how did that, those two um, important blows to the American economy affect, affect African-Americans? And so I decided to um, quote uh, a saying that comes at least in, in a, a lot of Black communities, but specifically I think about my own family, where it says when the United States or when America catches a cold, Black folks catch the flu. So usually um, the argument is that when the, when, the, when the nation is struggling, it's always the minorities that struggle the worst. In this case, speaking specifically about African-Americans, Black folks catch the flu. So what were the Black economic experiences during the Gilded Age? Um, before I continue, one of the things that I want to say is that I want you to get out of this presentation that it's definitely not just about oppression and suppression um, and dis disparate impacts, because of course we know that, but we're gonna talk about the dimensions of that. But I also wanna talk about, for back up, uh, lack of a better word, black resilience and resistance. That is how um, did black people respond to these attempts to shut them out of the economy, um, to keep them a um, dependent economic class. And so um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about opposition to Black own land ownership, um, how Black people still were able to um, gain access to land, um, not only in the South, but I will be talking about the West. Um, I will discuss discriminatory lending practices. So what does it, what does it mean back in the Gilded Age when Black people were trying to get mortgages um, to um, to fund their, um, whether it was their farms or other businesses, um, uh, small loans for, uh, to open up businesses. So what did that look like? Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the anti-enticement laws. This is part of Jim Crow, but specifically laws in the South that tried to forbid Northern industrial um, giants from um, recruiting black labor from the South to come North um, to help build up those economies. Um, and of course, and when we talk about factory labor um, and also mining, we'll be looking at um, the exclusion of uh, Black people from labor unions specifically. Um, I'm also going to talk about exclusion from farming cooperatives. And this also goes back to the populist movement. A lot of co-ops were formed, farming cooperatives. And the question was whether or not to include Black farmers in those or not. And then, of course, this is a period of great racial unrest racial violence and white terrorism. And so we have to always remind ourselves of that, that even though we're talking about economic experiences, the very lived experiences for many black people involve these um, attempts on um, suppressing not only black livelihoods, but actually taking black lives, um, violence, and of course, white terrorism. And those of you who know the book by C. Van Woodward, um, The Strange Career of Jim Crow is of course always looming. Again, taking away from this um, Black resistance and resilience. So the quest for land. Um, this is important and a lot, this is from Fair Farms, Maryland. Um, it's a website now. Um, and they've, they've done some really great work in thinking about land ownership in the South, um, historically, but also presently, right? So what does it mean to be to own land um, in the 21st century? But I love this quote, despite increasing segregation and land ownership disputes, right? Black farm land ownership steadily increased in the late 1800s. So this would be the period we're talking about the Gilded Age and hit an all time high national average in 1910. So we're moving into the progressive era where 14% of all farm owner, owner operators were black Americans, right? And that's thinking about their percentage, percentage of the population at the time, that is a very important statistic. This was in the decades following the Civil War in which freed slaves, so formerly free, formerly enslaved African-Americans and their descendants 
um, accumulated over or about 19 million acres of land in the South. Um, during the reconstruction period, black land ownership purchase, land owners purchased every available and affordable plot of land that they could. And I'll say in my own family, this was the case um, that people were trying to buy land, particularly land that was um, where they had been enslaved or their, their forefathers had been enslaved because they felt that they were rooted in the South and the South was a major part of their identity and sense so of who they were. But we also had the flip side of it, right? That there were people who were excluded from land ownership. There were policies in place that prevented black people um, from owning, for instance, 50% of land. So it is important that 14% 14, 14 is a really important number, but more, more likely than not, um, African-Americans who were engaged in farm labor were sharecroppers. And as we know, the sharecropping um, experiment led to generational uh, debt peonage. Um, what does that mean? That um, the sharecroppers had to um, buy their, their tools, their seed, um, their staples from the store that was owned by the plantation or the farm. And then once the, 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 the harvest came in, they would um, pay off those debts and then the rest they could keep from themselves. But in, in, in all reality, um, we saw that a lot of people were unable to pay back debts, not only because of the chicanery of the, of the store owners, but also there were natural uh, phenomena like floods and um, hurricanes, um, the bow weevil infestation of the cotton fields, things that would prevent individuals from having a harvest. Here I have a picture, even though it's from 1907, um, this is um, from a, a cotton field in Georgia, and you can see the sharecroppers, right? They're caught, um, and you can see also children. Um, this is very resonant with my family, as my mother often talks about being in the fields with her parents who were sharecroppers in the South, um, where they had to um, do these, you know, pick cotton in order to pay off debts and also to make a living. So the quest for land was important. We also know that um, there were some African-Americans who did not want to stay in the South um, and sought to go out West. And the Homestead Act was passed actually in the midst of the Civil War in 1862. And this advanced settler colonialism in the West. Um, a lot of Blacks were unable to, um, African-Americans and Blacks able to um, have access to land in the West initially under the Homestead Act. And so about four years later, so this is right after the Civil War, there was a Southern Homestead Act passed. And basically in 1866, if your claim, um, if your application was approved, African-Americans could get 80 acres of land in, in the South in 1866. And then two years later, um, 160 acres. There are some wonderful scholarship on this. I will say that sometimes that the land was not as productive and when I'm talking about that, I mean the fertility of the soil, et cetera, as uh, many had expected. And so some people abandoned their homesteads in the South and again, looked westward. And so black homesteaders um, became a reality during the Gilded Age period. Um, some people just wanted to homestead. They did not care who their neighbors were. Um, others wanted to found all black towns or what they call colonies. And what they wanted is for all the black people um, who wanted to be part of the colony um, to go there to establish their homestead claim, make sure that the sheriff, um, all the elected officials were black. Um, and that didn't mean that they didn't have um, contacts with white neighbors and other neighboring places, but they wanted to have that um, power, that political and social power um, concentrated in, in African-American hands because of course the history of their of their lives in the South, and then some people also came from the North, um, was such that they realized that being, for them, being under the control of a white political structure um, was not um, attractive to them. I only have two pictures because we could go on and talk about all of those, but um, these are closer to where I teach. Um, one is DeWitty Colony, or also known as Audacious. I love that name because they were they understood what they were doing, that this was an audacious effort to go out um, to the very edge of Western Nebraska and form a, 
uh, all black colony. Eventually whites were in the, um, in the DeWitty as well. And this is in Cherry County, Nebraska. And here you can see um, the groups of homesteaders and you can also see some white individuals as well. So you can see it's not just all black, but it's a predominantly black, formed as a, a predominantly black, all black colony. And then eventually some whites came in. Um, this is from Nicodemus, Kansas in Graham County. Um, this is an all black town. And this is the first Baptist church. Um, this picture was taken in 1907. Um, but again, as you can see, the point was to create these spaces where you could have um, black self-determination um, and where individuals um, could live as they, as they saw themselves free um, from white terror and white imposition. But again, this was part of that settler colonialism in the West where lands was taken from indigenous people and put into the homestead system. Um, here are just a couple of advertisements. Advertisements. Here's a Southern a picture, another picture from the Southern Homestead Act, where you can see individuals who took um, who took advantage of that act to to um, get farmland, and then of course one for Nebraska and one for Kansas, whole for Kansas, brother and friends, and and um, this is Pat Singleton or Benjamin Singleton as he was known, um, who was important to the founding of Nicodemus, Kansas. And then you just see a, a regular um, homestead ad advertisement for Nebraska, which was considered, quote, the garden of the West. Um, here, 50 million acres of grain and grazing land. So another thing that African-Americans tried to do, and hopefully this will work, is, um, is save money um, to establish trust, to bank, to have access to credit. As I said, it was hard for people to get um, loans and much less um, mortgage. And there was this idea that um, wealth accumulation was something that African-Americans should strive for um, during the Gilded Age. Here is a bank book from the Freedman Savings and Trust Company. This is from 1865. And so if you would go into there, you would see how much the individual, this is Anne Blue, how much she had in her bank, which she was saving. Um, this is a record for a Henry, um, Hobbs, so those are H's y'all, Henry Hobbs. Um, the application gives you some very interesting information. When the account was open, the application was made, um, where this person lived. Um, they, as you can say, a lot of the old stuff was taken out. So no longer name of master, name of mistress, no plantation, um, but they still keep, instead of height, they do age and complexion. So here's 44, black, um, father and mother, um, name of children, if they have any, if they were in a regiment or company during the Civil War, which one were they in, their place of birth, as they could much, uh, you know, sometimes it's not as uh, precise as one would like, residence, and then occupation. In this case, Henry Hobbs was a shoemaker. And then there are some um, comments. Here is the St. Luke Bank, uh, one of the important banks that was started in the period. So I'm going to launch this and hopefully. Um, you can hear it. Um, and this is a wonderful site um, put up by the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. They have three branches, one in Omaha, Nebraska, one in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and um, outside of Kansas City, excuse me, and one in Denver, Colorado. And what they did is they put together a presentation on the founding of um, America's first Black banks based on um, a book called Let Us Put Our Money Together, um, the founding of um, African-American banks. Um, do you, can y'all all see that? Can so, I get So Dr. Jones, I think if it opened on one of your other screens, we need to share the other screen. Absolutely, and then I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And hope that I can. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, can y'all see that? It says put our money together? Yes, absolutely. All right, and I'm gonna play it. It's only a minute, um, but um, this is a wonderful resource. Again, I can drop it in the chat if anybody wants to look at it on their own. Um, and there's you know more text, but the, again, a minute. One of the things we've done at the Kansas City Fed over the past several years is to offer a historic perspective on an important issue in the financial services world. In this case, we are taking a look at the history of America's African-American banks, particularly the earliest history. 
This is a history that I, I don't want to say it's been forgotten, but maybe it was in danger of fading away. Uh, this history has not been recaptured in a format that's accessible to most Americans for quite some time. And so I think it's our hope that we start a discussion that allows people to look at some of the catalysts behind these original institutions, and maybe that can serve as a little bit of an inspiration for those facing these problems today. We focus primarily on the history of three early African-American banks, uh, the True Reformers Bank in Richmond, Virginia, the Capital Savings Bank in Washington, D.C., and the Alabama Penny Savings Bank in Birmingham. Each one of these banks was not created as a way for its owners to uh, increase their profits. It was not viewed as a business opportunity. Each was created with, the, with an eye on improving conditions for the overall community and serving an important community need. These institutions were also particularly resilient. At a time when most American banks would only last between five and seven years, these institutions averaged a lifespan of about 20 years, making it through a particularly difficult national financial crisis in the late 1800s. So as, as I noted, I think it's really important um, to hear that story because um, as the narrator said, he's also the, the author of the book, um, most banks would last no more than three to seven years, but these banks, the three banks that are featured in the book, um, last an average of 20 years. And as he noted, it was not meant to be a for-profit bank. Um, these banks were started to be resources for the Black community, for the African-American community, particularly because there was um, an inability for many Black people to have access to credit and also to save their money in some place that was reputable um, other than the Freedman Saving Bank. So often they were started in communities where people lived. Can y'all see the new screen, the old screen? Yes. 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 Wonderful. All right. Um, um, so what about wage work? So we know we had land ownership, we had people saving money. Um, a lot of African-Americans were in the agricultural economy and that continued to be the case. But one of the things I wanted to talk about was wage labor, right? Um, and then I'm just also gonna talk a little bit about domestic work because we tend not, I mean, we know it, but we tend to forget that. Um, there was black migration during the late 19th century. And we tend to talk mostly about the great migration which starts then, but think about the places that were people, people were going, like the Exodusters who left and went to Kansas in the 1870s. Some of them went to be farmers, some of them stayed in the cities like Kansas City, Kansas, um, or Kansas City, uh, Missouri, and they became part of the wage labor um, economy, particularly in the North and in the, the what we call the, the old Northwest, right? The, now we call it the Midwest around the Great Lakes region, including where I am now in Buffalo. Um, there was a lot of factory work and we saw a great industrialization during the Gilded Age, Gilded Age period and the formation of labor unions. Um, also, there was mining work um, in the West, but also in areas like uh, West Virginia and Pennsylvania, right? And so people were forming labors, uh, uh, labor unions. The Knights of Labor were founded in 1869. The charismatic leader Terrence Powderly um, was um, leading efforts to bring laborers together. And then in 1886, you had the formation of the AFL or the American Federation of Labor, which is now part of the AFL-CIO after it was um, dissolved and became part of that in the 50s. And so the AFL in 1886 was led by Samuel Gompers. And so African-Americans were really the second choice for a lot of factory and mining work. And I'll talk about that. For the most part, that work went to immigrants and to what we call native born whites, um, white immigrants and native born whites. Um, and you would see black people coming more into factory um, work and mining work as strike breakers. The other kind of wage work, although a lot of this was off the books, um, were mostly black women who were engaged as maids and domestic workers, um, which was called so-called or quote unquote, the help. And when I say domestic workers, I wanna be clear. This includes cooks, laundresses, people who are doing work inside of the home, usually of um, middle-class and wealthy white individuals. But you also have African-American uh, women who are working as um, maids and domestic workers in um, hotels, 
um, for instance, um, or in resort regions, believe it or not, um, where my uh, part of my family comes from, Hot Springs, Arkansas, where you have um, these bathhouses. So there was a lot of, of, of domestic work um, that was on, on the table, as we say, where people are getting official paychecks, but also just people making money. And there was a, a great book about um, African-American women and domestic work. But what we know is that wage discrimination was part of the, the reality of Black women and Black men working in these industries, um, that they were not paid the same amount as their white counterparts. And if they were not excluded from those jobs, um, if they were not excluded from those jobs at all. As I noted, a lot of that um, factory and mining work was for, was perceived as being for um, some of the most recent immigrants coming from Europe, but also for a native born um, white people. Um, and eventually, excuse me, um, when those labor unions um, decided to strike against their own, um, their, their employees, employers, excuse me, um, that those employers will bring in black people as strike breakers. And so what we see, and for instance, this is just one example. This is from the Franklin coal mine strike in 1891, black workers were brought in. And instead of the white strikers, the laborers um, rising up against the, um, the owners, often they would attack the black workers and there would be racial violence. Um, enacted on those black individuals who were brought north, in some cases mostly northward, or from another side of town or state to come in and fill that work. So that's labor, um, and, and you know that's part of um, that economic experience. But in the face of that, there was a lot of emphasis on black land ownership. Um, I'm going to go ahead if you could give me a second um, and talk about. Um, this work, wonderful work by Lauren uh, Schwening, Swench, Schwenninger, excuse me, um, an article that she wrote called Black Owned Businesses in the South. And there's a lot of tables, but I only wanted to show one table from page 49. And what she does is she looks at the upper South and the lower South within five years of the end of the Civil War, most of the charts of 1870. And what she's interested in is what Black people are becoming, which Black people are becoming land, um, business owners how that differs from the pre-Civil War period. And then what does that tell us about this, the economy in the South? And what we see is that um, a lot of black owned businesses in the South are concentrated in what we call the lower South. The lower South is basically South Carolina, um, Georgia, Florida. And then if you go West, Mississippi, Alabama, New Orleans, Arkansas, right? So if you look at the charts, that's the, the places that she um, highlights. And then she has something that she calls the transition period, um, which is 1861 to 1880. Again, thinking about before the Civil War, what happens before the, during the Civil War and after. And this is important. Before the Civil War, um, most of the black owned shop, most black business owners owned shops. They were called shopkeepers or they owned stores. They were called storekeepers. Some of them actually, particularly in the Deep South, thinking about New Orleans, owned their own farms. This is before the Civil War or plantations. You had a lot of school, skilled artisans. You had people who cut down trees in the forest and they were wood dealers or what we call lumber dealers. Um, of course, there were blacks who were butchers and there were some African-Americans who owned boarding houses so that people could come um, if they were traveling, free black people because they couldn't be in the white um, hotels and the like and they could stay in those boarding houses. And what we know is that after the war, there was something that Schwenninger calls um, post-war economic dislocation. And we talked a little bit about that. What happens when you're kicked off the land, when people are trying to become landowners, when they no longer have a job um, because they have been formerly enslaved and the former slave owners don't want to pay people a fair wage, right? And so this dislocation, she argues, is what spurs more Black business ownership. In this case, um, she looked at the census um, for the Lower South in 1870, and what did she find? More blacksmiths become, um, blacksmiths, draymen, carpenters, grocers, and barbers become the top five businesses owned by black people in the South. Um, I won't go into this chart, but again, you have artisans, you have manufacturing businesses, people in the service industry, with um, some more retail businesses and farmers, right? And so we know that black land ownership 
But we also know that it's not just the South. There are small businesses in urban areas, both in the North and the South. And then I also have to say, when you look at those Western communities, you also have Black people who are owning um, businesses in the West. Um, so here, um, the, these are the top businesses that are open during the Gilded Age. One you just saw the film about, banks become important. Insurance companies, Black people couldn't buy insurance, not only for their land and their homes and their property, but also thinking about death insurance and life insurance. So that becomes important. Undertakers, what happens when African-Americans die and you want a funeral that you think that your loved one deserves? And someone who knows how to treat the body according to the cultural values um, that you um, grew up embracing. And so Black undertakers and funeral homes become another important business, retail stores in black neighborhoods, barbers and beauty shops, you need to get your hair done. Who's going to braid the hair? Who's going to style the coif? Who's going to cut the men's hair? And so those become important. And then there's something that call, we call informal economies. A lot of this is off the books work. Um, it, it could be considered extra legal in some cases. In some cases, it's not. Um, people who are um, picking up day work, um, that's informal economy. They're doing, you know, some may work on a day-to-day -day basis. That's informal economies, but you also have um, what we could consider extra legal work. I just wanted to, to bring out two examples and then I will be done. Um, Memphis um, becomes an important um, hub for um, Black business ownership. I'm sorry. Um, and then one I will talk about, Chicago South Side um, as well. And if anybody's been to Chicago, the South Side is an important part of the Black community. But one that I didn't list here, but I do want to talk about briefly to end my presentation, is, of course, um, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which we are all familiar with um, recently because of this year is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, but also popular culture, both um, Lovecraft, country as well as um, the Watchmen had um, put that episode uh, what that history has been put into those series and a lot of people didn't know that this was true and what we know about so-called Negro Wall Street or Little Africa which depends on who's writing the book or who you're speaking to is that there were um, black businesses up and down Greenwood District not just and then of course you had the cultural institution the you know the the churches and, and the other um, gathering halls. And so black business ownership became important to that Gilded Age experience and often was the target of white violence and terrorism. So I will close with these words um, that as we know, the Gilded Age economy was very, very um, harmful in many ways, right? To African-American people, um, they had to fight for everything that they wanted to uh, achieve and maintain in terms of the economy. But as we saw, there was a lot of Black resilience, right? That African-Americans, um, even if they were suffering, tried to make a way not out of no way. Not everyone was successful and we cannot pretend that they were, but there were ways that Black people were trying to push back against the economic constraints, the lack of federal protection um, coming from the Congress for their own economic situation. And so thank you so much for that. Professor Harmon. Well, there's very little time left. Um, let, me, let me just mention some of the main points that I was going to make and hope that um, we can combine at some point with the screen share. The, in the, in the Gilded Age, as now, the word Indians was the prevailing term or American Indians for many different distinct peoples or nations. Uh, and they brought to that era a history of very diverse original strategies for economic uh, adaptation to their environments. Uh, they brought long histories, in many cases, of adapting to colonization, colonial invasion uh, in various ways, adapting to vacillating U.S. aims and practices, uh, 
and to uh, and they of course brought many diverse original cultures. So by the Gilded Age period, many are facing hardship. Iroquois peoples in upstate New York's in that area um, surviving on scraps, scattered scraps of their original lands. Native peoples in California, their bands shattered um, by disease and colonial invasion and actual genocide. Um, but in other places, such as the Pueblos of New Mexico, um, people are, Native people are maintaining um, economic cultures dependent on agriculture that are many thousands, hundreds or thousands of generations old. Um, in some places, um, as in the parts of the Puget Sound, um, Native peoples are actually arguably prospering by commerce uh, with non-Indians, with um, qualified integration with the colonial economy. The Macaw at the northwest coast of um, what's now Washington state, are actually um, gaining a reputation for prosperity, whaling and sealing commercially. Menominees in what's now Wisconsin have commercial logging businesses. Um, nations or tribes in the Indian Territory, what's now Oklahoma, uh, in some cases um, have citizens of their nations who are um, arguably quite wealthy, raising cattle, cotton, um, running businesses in the towns of the area. But meanwhile, on the Great Plains, and I would show you here a photo of uh, bison hunters, um, there are several indigenous nations that since the 1700s have made a major change in their economic strategies um, and are surviving as nomadic bison hunters and traders. Um, and it is those people, those indigenous people that lawmakers, policymakers in Washington DC focus on um, and they focus on them and become quite preoccupied with that concept of Indianness, uh, because, of course, at the end of the Civil War, um, the resolution of the issue of slavery um, has opened a vast area for settlement, particularly the Central Plains, um, for, from California to the Mississippi. It's opened a vast area for what we see as a necessary American uh, settlement and development. And, uh, and the life way of the nomadic bison hunting peoples in that area is assumed to be incompatible with US civilization. Um, and of course, the nomadic nations see that conflict, that incompatibility too. Uh, and they are resisting, they have been resisting um, since before the Civil War with uh, arms. And they have, especially during the Civil War, stored, scored some major victories. Um, uh, and they continue to do that in the decade afterwards. Uh, and the, for lawmakers, other policymakers, um, Members of the American elite are preoccupied with these wild, so-called wild Indians, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Nez Perce, the Modoc, as barriers to progress. The progress, of course, is what they see as a superior civilization. Uh, and they agree on the need to tame, to constrain these peoples, these uh, indigenous peoples, um, or in some cases argue for their elimination. The railroads authorized by the Civil War enable uh, the defeat of those peoples ultimately by bringing in troops that can be moved around, also by bringing in commercial or recreational bison hunters who uh, manage to help deplete um, pretty much end the 
viable herds of bison um, in short order. So the nation is left, the US nation is left with the question of what to do once these peoples, native peoples, these wild Indians are subjugated. They cannot now be removed from beyond the United States, which has been the policy, the official policy since the 1830s, but has been uh, gradually uh, changing, um, begrudgingly changing as in the view of many US policymakers. But how to incorporate, should we incorporate, can, can they incorporate people so culturally different who have not of course been aiming to join the union? This was the Indian problem of the Gilded Age from the policy view of the policymakers, lawmakers. This was the image of Indians as uncivilized, living by the chase rather than a modern economy. Congress reluctantly okays the creation of reservations, isolated areas within what are claimed to be US territories or within United States of the United States, uh, isolated areas where Indians can presumably learn to support themselves as the ideal rural non-Indian uh, is presumed to do, um, primarily by farming, possibly by ranching. So the map of the United States, which I'm not able to show you, um, comes to include uh, a number of reserved area for areas for native peoples. Uh, but there's discontent from the beginning. Discontent, of course, in, among many of the Indian people who are unable to make, at least initially, to make a decent living in those isolated areas. Discontent among non-Indians um, because of corrupt, government corruption which contributes to Indian suffering in many cases by skimming off the resources that are supposed to go to the Indians. Um, discontent uh, among land hungry people who see too much land reserved for Indians in the center of the uh, continent. Um, so enter so-called humanitarian reformers, the friends of the Indians who sell the lawmakers on a plan for Indians integration, a plan for Indians assimilation. Um, the plan is to give them the benefits of the superior civilization, give them the benefits of US citizenship, uh, induce wholesale culture change with economic change as the key to that culture change, a change in economic culture. And so from 1885 into 1900, Congress approves several acts to achieve this, or presumably achieve this transformation of Indian peoples. Again, always with this image of these nomadic, um, peoples of the central part of the continent in mind and not the diversity of Indians across the country. And the first national laws, uh, these are the first national laws passed by Congress that apply to Indians on tribal lands as individuals, not to tribes as polities but to individual reaching into the tribal polities to try to change individual Indians' cultures. Um, this is a reflection of the power balance that the United States officials see. The Indians appear to be uh, either doomed or on their, or at their nadir. Uh, there's an arrogance of power. There's a faith in the imperial project that allows or uh, induces Congress to simply ignore the law, the international and United States law that identifies the tribes as sovereigns, independent self-governing peoples. So 
the next screen you would have seen um, shows you the terms of the so-called General Allotment Act of 1887, also known as the Dawes Act after its principal um, sponsor, Henry L. Dawes, Senator Henry L. Dawes from Massachusetts. Um, it's enacted on the assumption that these Indians are essentially primitive communists, not um, property owners. The assumption is that giving Indians as individuals property, real property, will be a civilizing force that will in and of itself elicit what they call intelligent selfishness, the basis of the US progressive capitalist um, or free enterprise economy. One reformer describes this General Allotment Act as the mighty pulverizing engine that will break up the tribal mass. How am I doing on time? We're really going to have to wrap up because we're right up against our time. I'm so sorry because I, well, I know you've got more to say, but if you can try to wrap it up, that would be great. Much more to say. Um, we'll have to see the terms of the act. But I do want to say um, the concept of changing economic cultures extends to uh, schools. There can be no preparation of Indians for citizenship without a degree of education. And the schools for Indian children, which are mandated by Congress in 1891 and then again in 1898, um, essentially teach the children or try to teach the children um, the, the economic culture of the dominant non-Indian society. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing I would say is um, just to contrast the, the last uh, Indian nations to be told that their lands will be divided uh, into private property for individual Indians are in the Indian territory, the so-called five civilized tribes, where the argument is, um, according to the lawmakers, that this must happen because uh, some Indians are getting extremely wealthy by taking advantage of the opportunity to enclose the common tribal lands. And this, this uh, inequality must be attacked on behalf of the poor, uh, poor Indians. Um, so if I had time, maybe we would have wrapped up with uh, an observation that uh, I guess the takeaway the expansion, U.S. expansion into the West entailed the expropriation of a vast amount of native wealth. It was engineered and enabled by lawmakers who purported to offer Indians the only economic culture that would ensure them survival and prosperity. And in fact, in most cases, um, this policy of coercive assimilation actually ended up impoverishing, depriving Indians of their lands. Um, and impoverishing them. Dr. Harmon, we're so honored to have you, and I'm so sorry that we've had technical problems. Um, uh, I don't don't quite know how to apologize enough about. Well, it's my uh, flow at my end. Well, Something's wrong at my end. You know. Next time we'll learn and we'll have the um, PowerPoints emailed to Sam so he can always just step in and do a, a share. So lessons learned for each time. Uh, Dr. Jeanette, uh, Jeanette Eileen Jones, you have done a wonderful job of putting things in perspective. And if I might take a quick risk to say amidst both of your presentations, um, there there are a couple of common themes that Dr. Harmon, when you spoke at the very beginning, you said one of the things you wanted everyone to remember is that Native Americans are not a singular people. They are a multiplicity of cultures. And the Gilded Age was a time where it was very difficult for them to hold on to their culture. 
because of the schools issue, because of the issues around uh, taking of land and trying to deal with land in different ways than were culturally appropriate for the uh, for the Native Americans. Dr. Eileen, Jeanette Eileen Jones, you said at the beginning that rather than talk about a parade of horribles, you wanted to talk about the resilience of the Black community, the African American community, and the fact that people joined together to create African American banks, to build a business community that, you know, we recently uh, saw the focus on Tulsa as a hundred, the hundredth year anniversary of the destruction of Black Wall Street, but that was developing during the Gilded Age. And so I would invite, uh, we'll have to figure out how to do a longer conversation because for both of these issues, there, there's a lot more to say. Um, we, we, we had one of our people who said they're armchair historians and, and we, are, we have many people who are armchair historians really wish to know as much as possible um, about these matters and you two are the actual experts. And so we'll try to figure out how to do some follow-up conversations with you um, that we can offer to people um, so that we can really make this work. As we look ahead to the upcoming activities for the Historical Society, next week we turn to the art and culture of the Gilded Age. And so we'll be doing that as our final uh, presentation on the Gilded Age, although with the little things we've learned today, maybe we'll do something, uh, we'll do something uh, else with, with the two of you. And then the coming up the week of November 16th and 18th, on Tuesday the 16th, we have a distinguished scholar who's going to talk to us about the perspective of the first Thanksgiving from the Native American perspective, uh, what, looking at the mythology of Thanksgiving. And then on Thursday, the 18th, we have a book talk by Robert Watson on George Washington's final battle. And that is the battle to establish Washington, DC as our capital city. So we invite you to join these. As always, we thank you for your help, your support, uh, thank you, Dr. Harmon. Thank you, Jeanette Eileen Jones, for being with us. We were honored to have you. Be well. Bye. Thank you so much for having us. Be well. Thank you. Oh, and can you send us that for me the information? I would love to join that talk about the art if I can be a uh, attendee. Absolutely. We yeah. would be honored to have you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.